Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our bi-monthly webinar. Uh, my name is Jesse McClellan. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Arborist Association, and I really appreciate everyone joining us this evening for this webinar on um, adopting our tree selection for climate change. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. I'm so excited to see everyone um, next week, hopefully for saluting branches and um, for our um, 26th annual tree climbing championship, which will be on um, September 21st. So I hope I get to see uh, some faces, some familiar faces there. We also will be doing a first aid CPR class immediately following that. We also have a bunch of exciting Spanish training opportunities coming up. So if you speak Spanish, I hope that you'll look at our events list and check those out. And then also hope you'll join us for the International Tree Climbing Championship, which is going to be in October in Savannah. It's very exciting that it's going to be in our home state. So I hope I get to see a bunch of a bunch of you there for those events. In terms of this webinar, if you have questions, we're going to try to answer them as they come in. So please drop your questions in the Q&A as they come up, and I will interrupt uh, our speaker, Dave, with those questions and let him answer those live. So feel free to answer questions as we go along, and then he'll also reserve some time at the end for those questions as well. And then if you're here for a CEU, there is one CEU for this uh, webinar, and I will drop that code for the CEU in the chat at the very end of the session. So stay tuned for that. There will be a link for that in the chat at the end. So without further ado, I welcome Dave. Dave is um, a board member of the GAA. He is our vice president. He is a um, Georgia forestry urban forester, and he is a newly appointed uh, tree and plant appraisal qualified arborist. Um, he just passed that exam a couple of weeks ago, so that's very exciting. He also holds his track certification, has a degree in environmental sciences, and is an overall just nice human. So I am excited to have him as our speaker this evening. Welcome, Dave. Thank you so much for being our speaker. Chuck, thanks for the nice intro. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate y'all taking your evening to be here. Hopefully I won't bore you all to death tonight, but I'm assuming most of us here are tree nerds, so hopefully we'll all be in good company. Let's see if I can share my screen here in a bit. Today we'll be talking about adapting tree pallets to a changing climate. Let's see. Jesse, are we seeing the right view there? No, it doesn't look like you're sharing your screen right now. Okay, hold on here. Um... There we go. All right. Let me see if I can get this. Shoot, I had this just a second ago. Hold on here. There we go. All right. Y'all seen the slide okay? Yeah, that's great. There we go. All right. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into this. I really encourage y'all to view this as a um, discussion today, so I'm not just ranting at you. We'll be talking a lot about what species to plant to prepare for a changing future. Uh, and again, that is not a subject I am an expert in. It's something I have a lot of experience in maintaining trees in an area where I, uh, I'm also fortunate to live and getting to see what survives and what doesn't and what needs a lot of maintenance and what doesn't. But especially if there's anyone here in, in the nursery trade familiar with maybe more variety of, of cultivars that are good for what we're talking about here today, please drop your knowledge in the chat. Let's talk. Let's learn from each other. I guess I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Dave Long. I work with the Georgia Forestry Commission as an urban forester. There are a few of us around the state. Some of y'all might have met my colleagues, Lee and Sam. We provide technical assistance for a variety of urban forestry initiatives around the state. What does that actually mean? Here are some of the things we provide uh, public entities throughout the state of Georgia. Anything from uh, planning and technical assistance to help with grant funding to storm response. Every day is a little bit different. Uh, but if you are a public entity here today and any of these services interest you, please drop me a line. Let's get in touch. We'd love to help y'all. Um, but enough about me. Let's talk about trees here. I wanted to start with this image here of a, a nice image of all the things that an urban tree can be subject to stress-wise. Um, I started this 
presentation, making it with the idea that we'd be talking mostly about climate change and kind of broad climactic forces that are more or less beyond our control. The more I did it, though, the more I realized that you can't really parse out uh, urbanization from climate change when you're talking about trees, uh, especially when you're talking about stress on trees, because here in Georgia, we are getting hit hard with both. And it's definitely having a big effect on our trees. And oftentimes those effects of climate change look very similar to the effects of urbanization in terms of how they affect the tree. You could have physical damage from things like cars and pedestrians, but likewise you could have, and that could damage the bark. Meanwhile, you also have increased solar radiation happening, which on some of our species can cause bark damage. I realize you couldn't parse this too out, so we'll be talking about both today. Why should we care about this? Healthy trees help our communities thrive. Uh, we want a thriving urban canopy. It increases our property values. It can be shown by three to 15% potentially. Uh, increases uh, the likelihood that people, increases the, the time that people wanna spend in our communities. And that can include uh, business districts as well, encouraging shoppers to spend longer around our businesses that have uh, high canopies and shaded areas. Trees cool our surroundings. We've all felt this. Um, it can happen by as much as 10 degrees. Uh, in city neighborhoods. They improve public safety. There is a correlation to lower crime rates with trees. Uh, they keep our air healthier by trapping dust, and pollen, and smoke, uh, and carbon dioxide. They provide a lot of environmental benefits like oxygen production, carbon dioxide absorption, erosion prevention, improved water quality. They provide wildlife habitat. It's said that during a heavy rain, a single acre of good soil with ground cover can absorb as much as 20,000 gallons of water per hour. We'll talk in a bit about storms and how those are changing here in Georgia and trees in a lot of ways are some of our best defenses against that. So we want to plant trees that will live for 100 years and get big and provide the most amount of these services. Um, so I mentioned urbanization earlier and how it's affecting our trees. I guess a bit of background of trends uh, and how this is happening in Georgia right now. Uh, it can be a little confusing if you just look at the statistics because currently Georgia has technically increased in canopy coverage in the past few years, um, but most of that is due to forestry practices in South Georgia. Uh, meanwhile, especially in the north of our state and on the coast, we are experiencing rapid urbanization at an unprecedented rate. Um, it's causing uh, the fragmentation of our forests uh, to a really large scale. It's quite a serious issue, but it's probably not going anywhere. We're expecting to see a 46% increase in population uh, by 2030, with 82% of Georgians living in cities or suburbs or other non-rural areas. And we estimate that 43% of that will be in the 10 counties around the Atlanta metro area. This is causing a lot of environmental effects, increased stormwater runoff, we're, we're paving more surfaces and that water is not getting absorbed. Again, this is where trees can come into play. That's leading to impaired water quality and sedimentation and eutrophication of our waterways. Forests are being fragmented from increased development. I'm sure we've all seen subdivisions like the one up top there, putting pressure on our wildlife, impairing the air quality, getting increased CO2 when there's not as much trees to absorb that. And there's an increased risk of diseases and insects and put on our trees from this urbanization. Like I said, trees are getting hit in Georgia right now with the double whammy of that urbanization and that climate change. Again, especially in North Georgia around that 75, 85 corridor. Currently, that is uh, one of the fastest deforesting areas in the country right now. So on top of that, our climate is changing. This is not a political issue. This, these are scientific facts backed by years of research. Beyond that, anecdotally, I'm sure all of us, I'm sure there are a lot of folks out here like me that have spent most of their lives outside here in Georgia. I'm sure a lot of us remember having to wear a parka 20 years ago in the winter and now just being able to get by with a hoodie. Our temperatures are warming. That's probably the biggest effect of climate change right now. This is driven mostly by human-caused factors, mostly greenhouse gas emissions and land use changes. As land is converted from grassland and forests into agriculture and then eventually into urban area, that soil is disturbed and all that carbon that was captured in it is released into the atmosphere, creating a warming effect. I won't get too much into this because I'm not a climatologist. I'm an arborist. But you can see to the right, this is our, our current climate model right here with warming temperatures increasing exponentially each year. And we predict that to continue in that trend into the future. Below is what they predict on that blue line would happen if we did not have all these anthropogenic and human caused factors contrib contributing to climate change. From a plant perspective, though, we mostly see this 
on the ground happening as range changes of plants. Uh, so you can divide the world into these hardiness zones and just kind of tell you what plants will grow and what climate. This has changed pretty recently in Georgia. I think in the last 10 years or so, they've moved like North Georgia from a 7B to an 8A. So these are all gradually shifting northward as things get hotter and more humid. Again, this is not a, a universal trend. Different regions are affected differently. You can even see out west, some areas have technically dropped into cooler zones. I don't know what the deal with that is. Um, but we're definitely going to focus on Georgia today and kind of the trends we're seeing, which again, is warmer temperatures, increased humidity, and increased storm surges, uh, which we'll get into that differently. This all brings me into the concept of climate analog cities. So what I say with that is, so climatologists that are making these models and predicting what our future climate would look like have been comparing places in the present to places in the future. In other words, 50 years from now, what city is going to have a climate like 50 or, how should I say this? In 50 years, what will the climate of, say, Atlanta, Georgia look like? And what city can we compare that to presently? So right now, the sort of 50-year climate analog is down here in the Mississippi Delta. They, I guess their models chose Kaplan, Louisiana, or based on a different model, Natchez, uh, Louisiana, in this situation. I think this is partially true. And when we get to what species are adapted to a changing climate, we'll definitely be looking at uh, plants that are more adapted to the southern, wetter, hotter environment. Um, I think the problem here is that while these might be climate analogs, they're in, sure, the climate of Georgia might look like Kaplan, Louisiana in 50 years. They're not necessarily analogs for other environmental factors that affect tree growth, such as effects of urbanization, soil types, pests, and diseases. Those are also things we want to try and consider when we're preparing our future plantains to last for the next 100 to 200 years. It's not just that climate change, but also that urbanization change and not just focusing on the heat, basically. So let's talk about some environmental causes that are currently stressing out our trees. Uh, again, like I said, we are seeing increased temperatures throughout the nation right now, um, which is causing a lot of, could cause a lot of trees like the ones on the right. This is, again, you can't really separate the climate changes from the urban land use changes because on top of that increased heat, we're also seeing increased impervious surfaces, more parking lots, more buildings, more sidewalks, more paved areas. Uh, so this is compounding that heat coming from the atmosphere by radiating it off of these surfaces. Um, likewise, those increased impervious surfaces are increasing the amount of runoff we get with storm events, which again coincides with the climatic change because Georgia has always had storms, floodings, and droughts, uh, but we are seeing more extreme weather events lately. So stronger storms, stronger flooding surges, more frequent storms and floods and droughts. In other words, things are just getting more volatile. So this is something we need to account for when we're choosing our tree species. And again, that's compounded by the impervious because you're getting both more rain, but also less soil volume to absorb that rain and runoff. Urban soil, again, this is more of a, an urbanization cause and a climactic change, but generally as this development happens, we're seeing more pollutants in our soil. The thing that's mostly affecting trees in the urban environment is compaction and lack of soil volume. As you can see on this poor little tree on the right, a lot of our trees here in Georgia, they might be adapted to that hard packed clay. They still want a good layer of forest stuff on the top to build that root structure. So we're seeing increased soil compaction, which is something we need to prepare for in our future plantings. There's increased pressure from invasive species, both in a forest setting, you get uh, competition from invasive plants, but also with the changing climate, we're probably going to see increased pressure from invasive tree pests and increased reproduction and fecundity from those species. We'll get into that in a minute. Like, increased humidity too, that leads to more fungi on our trees potentially. And like I said, we're seeing these shifting historic ranges. Uh, pardon me, all there is a train coming by my office right now. But yeah, we're seeing things shift northward too, and we need to prepare for that as well. In other words, trees that might have defined in Atlanta 50 years ago, uh, might not do as well. Signs of stress we can look for, crown scorch and tip dieback is a really common one, especially from uh, too much radiant heat. Loose bark, we see this especially in our maple species with increased sun cracks. In other words, the usual signs of, that you would see uh, of tree stress in general are going to be the same signs from climatic stress or stress from being in an urban area. Fungal fruiting bodies, 
defoliation. Chlorosis is one you'll see a lot, especially with these changes in hydrology and increased flooding and drought is something to be on the lookout for. And of course, with increased pests, you'll see increased signs of pests. This is one of the Umbrosia beetle that I predict to probably be a lot to continue in its growth in the next few years as our climate gets more humid. So let's talk about pests and climate change. Uh, most of these observations I got here today are from our, our entomologists here in um, the Forestry Commission and what they predict uh, the future might look like. So like I said, these plants are expanding ranges. Um, but again, that is happening over time, over the course of, of generations, is how trees move from seed to seed. Um, but these pests are expanding at a faster rate. Again, there is some speculation here. We're still seeing the effects of this in real time. So not all of this is necessarily backed necessarily by data and current studies of what I'm getting into today, uh, but it is backed by the observations and experience of forest entomologists. But one example of this that we've already seen, I guess this is in the form of a plant pest, as opposed to an insect or fungi, but we're seeing the range of Kogan grass in South Georgia start to shift northward uh, as northern Alabama and Georgia get hotter and they're moving up. Overall, invasive pests are going to be more adaptable to a changing climate than native pests are going to be. They're just straight up tougher. They can handle those swings in temperature and moisture better. We're seeing a longer growing season, both for our plants and for their pests. Um, so this means that there is a longer period where these pests can um, reproduce and go for their life cycle. Uh, and so oftentimes you'll get more generations in a season now going forward than you would have seen in the past. Um, we all saw this in real time this summer with the southern pine beetle here in northwest Georgia. Uh, we had a long, hot, dry summer, uh, a longer growing period for that beetle. They were able to produce more generations uh, per year than they were previously and infect more trees. Uh, on top of having a longer growing reproductive season, these pests are going to have a longer damage season, a longer window where they can get into those trees and start uh, damaging them. There's potential for warming temperatures to open us up to invasive pests from other areas. Again, this is all very speculative right now. Fortunately, we haven't seen too much of this yet, but it could potentially be on the horizon and just something to keep an eye out. Historically, most of our pests here have been from Northern Eurasia, like China, Japan, Eastern Europe, places like that. Places that are more of a current climate analog with our own, a temperate climate with a winter and a summer and similar levels of humidity. But with a warming climate, it does open us up to pests from other areas where we might not have seen them coming from historically, like Africa, like Southeast Asia, South America. So we could see some new players in the game in the near future. A universal trend of invasive pests uh, becoming stronger and more reproductive as our climate change. It's not a, a, a universal trend across the board. Some of our pests are probably going to be negatively affected or even just neutral to warming temperatures. For example, the emerald ash borer and the spongy moth don't seem to be too affected by warming temperatures. They don't really seem to care either way. They're able to invade from the, the south all the way up north and tolerate a, a wide range of temperature change. I guess on a good note, the woolly adelgid populations here in Georgia could potentially be reduced by warmer temps. Again, doesn't mean they're, they're leaving for good. It just means that they're migrating northward, again, with those hemlock trees. Overall, too, like we said, climate change and urbanization combined puts more stress on our trees. The more stress the tree, the more of a buffet it is and for to be food and habitat for these pests. So the general trend here is more pests, more uh, reproductive cycles per season, potentially new ones, uh, but some of them might actually be slowed down by warming climate. So let's get into tree species and how we can uh, prepare for these changing climates and increased urbanization. What's gonna work here? I guess before I get into it, I wanna address the issue of maintenance here. Regardless of what tree species you plant, a changing and more volatile climate is gonna increase the maintenance needs on trees, their need for water, for mulch, for just being monitored. So no matter what species you do, we're probably gonna see that tree trend of trees needing more maintenance in the future. Before I get into it, I'll be talking about like native versus non-native species in here. Just want to go over what I'm talking about and what I mean when I use these terms. When I'm talking about a native species, I'm talking about things that have been here for thousands of years, achieved symbiosis with their ecosystem. Your white oaks, your tulip poplars, we know these, they're our friends. We'll talk about non-native, non-invasives a bit. I don't get into this as much here, but again, if y'all have experience with this, 
please drop it in the chat. Let me know what species have worked for you and you've seen do good, especially in hot environments with compact soil that we're going to see a lot more of in the future. But non-natives, non-invasives, these are very important for combating climate change. There are some environments and probably more environments we'll see in the future where just no native trees are really going to be able to cut it. We're talking those downtown areas, those parking lots, those areas where the combined um, reflective heat and high temperatures are just going to really scorch most of our natives. So those are things where things like a parodia or crepe myrtle can shine. But again, we want to use ones that we know are non-invasive, that have been planted for at least the last 50 or so years, that have shown to not be invasive. By invasive, that is both introduced from a, a foreign area and also has the ability to spread and outcompete native biodiversity. So more of a measure of behavior than origin. There are just a lot of terms out there to describe species origin and what they can do. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. I'm mostly going to be focusing on native species today. It is definitely a bit of a bias I have in terms of when I make planting plans and selections. But there are real life benefits to planting native. Again, you won't always be able to get fit a native tree everywhere. Sometimes you got to go non-native. But native trees are better for our ecology and our wildlife. They provide a lot more of those environmental services that I talked about earlier than the non-native ones in terms of soil stabilization, water absorption, air filtration. So I generally encourage planting of them whenever you can get away with it. There's also a lot of aesthetic beauty to be found in our native species, especially these days. You have so many great cultivars out there that are being experimented with, uh, where you get both the benefits of, of having native biodiversity in your landscape, while also being able to select plants that uh, maybe your clients want a bit more that have those aesthetic values, pretty fall color or, or flowering, et cetera. Um, yeah, someone mentioned parodia. That is very much a bomb-proof tree. I did not include a slide on this because I was so focused on the natives, but um, parodia persica, it, when there's truly a, a place where few other trees will grow, uh, especially in limited soil volume, parodia is, is, does very well. Um, it definitely has a, a less of a maintenance need than some other plants. Again, there are times to plant non-native, uh, again, when you have to, when natives really just won't cut it in that area. And when it's proven to be non-invasive, and I, when I mean proven, I mean having been regularly planted around here for at least the last 50 years without signs of invading. So no, not Chinese elm, but we can get into that later. That could be a summer subject. Right now, it's estimated that about 24% of native Southeast trees are currently used in the nursery trade. So there could potentially be a lot of species out there that we don't know that could be well adapted to a changing climate and to urban areas that we just don't really know yet. Natives are great, too, because they are already adapted to our ecology in terms of our, our soil and our climate. Some of them might not be as adapted to a changing climate, like we said. But the nice thing about Georgia is if you go back to that image of the hardiness zones, is we have several in the state. So we'll talk about how you can draw from areas of Georgia where you can predict that your climate might look like in the near future. So I'll be talking a lot about trees that are very common in South Georgia here because those are often ones that are adapted to a swampier climate, which means both increased heat and humidity, but are also adapted to wet and soggy and low oxygen soils, which is often mimicked by the compact soils we have in our urban areas. Again, always put the right tree in the right place. You might plant a tree that's really well adapted to climate change. Oh, but you planted an overstory tree under a power line and maybe it was not tolerant of utility pruning. So I always just like to include this slide when I'm talking about planting so we can break it down by height here a bit. Let's talk about our overstory here. Yeah, someone mentioned, Janine, you mentioned sourwood. So that is one that is definitely, I've seen struggle a lot in urban sites. I really honestly would not recommend planting it except in a forest setting. But yeah, not a great one. Sourwood, oh, Chianthus, I believe that's fringe tree. I'm not great with my Latin names. And serviceberry, those are two, yeah, highly requested natives for their aesthetic qualities, for sure. And those are two very good ones. We'll talk about those in a minute. Those are ones I actually highly recommend for a changing climate. Um, starting with our overstory here, though, this is going to be a, a true climate change king in the near future. If you can fit an overstory here and there's not a conflict with areas where the roots are going to grow in terms of a foundation or a sidewalk, this is a really great climate adapted tree, the bald cypress, which is about 60, 80 feet, 20, 30 feet wide, has a lot of those aesthetic qualities that clients in an urban area might be looking for in terms of a nice pyramidal shape and that pretty golden fall color. 
So this is a swamp tree. And interestingly enough, a lot of those qualities that make it adapted to the swamp also make it adapted for hot, humid, compact urban areas. Um, it's oddly enough very drought tolerant despite being a swamp tree. You would think it would really need that hydric soil, but it's able to really tolerate that full range of flood to drought to flood to drought really well. Uh, and again, as long as there aren't sidewalks or foundations or physical restraints, does really well in compact soil. If it needs to, it can even put up those knees to get that respiration that it needs. But yeah, a, a really tough tree, fairly pest resistant too. Got that rot resistant wood we love. Let's talk about our oaks here. We're trying to fill our overstory with climate adapted trees. We are in the hot spot of oak biodiversity. I believe we have about 52 species. So a lot of those are not well adapted to climate change, and some of them are really well adapted to climate change. And here are some that I have seen do pretty well, and a couple that I've seen do okay, but just haven't had quite enough experience with. But I've talked to some folks in the nursery trade, and they're very excited about the potential for these trees to get to market more. Swamp chestnut oak is a great one. Again, a, a swamp tree. So it is used to that kind of full sun, hot environment, with poor drainage. But again, somehow those features that allow it to adapt in really saturated soils also seem to make it really good for drought tolerance as well. Same with the swamp white oak. I almost use these interchangeably with planting, depending on the rockiness and drainage of the soil or really just what's available. Those are both solid options. Fairly pest resistant, drought resistant, flood resistant, compassion resistant can handle a lot of sun. Overcup oak too, same story, tolerates that poor drainage, that full sun, and a lot of the conditions we're gonna see in our changing climate. So where you have compact saturated soil, those three are really great ones to go to, especially if you have an area that's receiving a lot of like washout, maybe from streets and sidewalks, those are great. Moving up the slope a little, or where I recommend those Schumar to Nuttall oaks. I know one of these is technically native to Georgia. One of them is technically more of a northern and midwest tree, but they both do great. I almost use these interchangeably on planting plants, depending on what nurseries have in stock. Just both very tough trees, but still have that kind of broad canopy and fall color that a lot of clients like and provide a lot of that shade. While also providing that mass and benefits to wildlife that I know I personally love. Really just bomb-proof trees. I, I planted these in downtown areas. I planted these on Construction lots uh, post grading uh, and before like turf was installed, even with like heavy equipment moving around them and stuff and occasionally sustaining injuries from that, they did just fine. Two just really tough, solid trees that I recommend a lot. The Georgia oak is an interesting one. I know some nurseries are, are experiencing with creating cultivars of this right now for more urban plantings. Typically in the wild, it, it's a very scraggly tree with not a whole lot of aesthetic quality. But I know there are some cultivars getting out there on the market now that kind of have a more rounded canopy. Um, Georgia oak is particularly good for those urban sites with lots of reflective heat. In addition to looking to the swamp for potential climate change adapted species, looking to our rock outcrops could be a potential place to look for those climate adapted species as well in terms of things that can tolerate a lot of um, atmospheric heat and reflective heat off of that granite. So someone was mentioning uh, fringe tree earlier. That would be another example of that. Again, that native one is great for the, those really sunny environments, but also the, the Chinese fringe tree is a great one as well. And it's just even tougher and can tolerate that clay and compaction a little bit better. Whereas the Georgia oak and the native fringe tree do, at least in nature, prefer a little bit of rockiness and, and some to their soil as opposed to just straight clay. Cherry bark oak is another one, too, that I know folks are experimenting with. Again, uh, a swamp-adapted tree that's range expands in the south Georgia. Again, a bit more heat-adapted than maybe some of our other native oak species. Uh, definitely, if there's an area where you're getting that wet, saturated, compact soil, that's one I might suggest a cherry bark oak. And again, still getting out there in the market, being experimented with different cultivars. But it's one I, I hope to see more in the future that I think could really withstand climate change really well. Basswoods, tilias. These seem to be a pretty urban tolerant tree from Georgia all up and down the East Coast. They seem to be doing pretty well. They fill that overstory really well. They make a nice broad canopy that provides lots of shade. Um, they don't do as well like in full on sun in the way that like a, a nut all oak or shoemart oak does. Ideally, a little bit of shade is ideal for them. Again, this is an odd one because in nature it tends to grow in the shade next to the creek, but right, but not necessarily like 
on the bank, more in the kind of well-drained soil of the floodplain, but seems to just do really well in the urban environment, in my experience. It does not have the strongest wood, but it's still usually pretty good structure. There are a variety of cultivars available for this too, to really provide more selection for your specific site or needs. Again, another one that has a lot of benefits to wildlife in terms of providing food and hosts uh, to pollinators, and things like that. Okay, we got some more examples uh, of cultivars uh, of oaks that are doing well. Thanks for writing that, Tim. So Tim mentioned the Titleist and Solstice not all oak. So those might be ones to look into. And the Windstar and other willow oak cultivars. Willow oak is, is definitely a climate adapted tree and, and definitely a great one to plant. I didn't include it on the slide just because I figure a lot of us are so familiar with it and we do have so many of them. But yeah, willow oak is definitely one to look to too. Similar in toughness to an overcup or, or a nut all. But yeah, I recommend the nut all and shoemar just because they do tend to have a more kind of, at least for projects where aesthetic value is a high priority, those two do tend to have a much more like kind of broad rounded crown that people tend to like. Whereas the willow oak, if you're not pruning it, can get scraggly. But certainly a tough tree. Willow oak is great. Tolerates compaction and heat really well. Again, basswood, if y'all know of any cultivars or variety of this, please drop them in the chat. I'm curious what y'all have to hear. I know there are a lot out on the market out there, but just one I've seen do really well, especially with reflective heat. And I've just seen grow in things like parking lots and areas where you wouldn't really expect it to do well. Sycamore is a good one if you got the space too. Again, this is one, it's not the perfect climate change tree because it is susceptible to a lot of pests like powdery mildew and anthracnose. Typically, these pets don't kill it, but definitely if it's in an area where aesthetics are a high priority, it's not the best. You definitely need to give these guys a lot of space. But again, those conditions that make them adapted to, to the creek and the floodplains also make them well adapted to the urban area and the changing climate in terms of being able to tolerate full sun and compact soil. Not quite as drought tolerant in my experience as maybe some of the other trees like bald cypress or, or those large oaks. So they do prefer soggy soil but can tolerate a pretty large range and can definitely tolerate that compact soil really well. There are some issues with powdery mildew, and I presume with increased humidity in the environment, we're probably going to see more of that on our sycamores, especially if we're planting a lot right next to each other. Uh, but we also have the London plain too. It's European cousin, which can be a great alternative that's a little more resistant to those pests and produces a little less debris that can clog storm drains like these guys can. Maples. So... I'm sure we've all seen a lot of red maples flop in the urban environment over the year. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is that is more an effect of the urbanization and planting practices than the changing climate. And because they are such a pretty tree that can provide so much benefit to wildlife and aesthetic value in the landscape, I do want to consider them in the mix. But if you're doing red maples and you're planning for the future and you want these trees to potentially live up to 100 years, I recommend going with cultivars over straight species. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the Florida Flame and October Glory, both very heat tolerant. The problem with maples in the urban area is that compaction issue. They might be tolerant to the changes in, in heat, but I'm sure we've all seen a lot of them die from those girdling roots and compact soil. But if you find a site that maybe has a lot of heat and radiative heat, but has decent drainage in the soil, these are ones to consider to really fill in that over to mid-story uh, and provide that beautiful fall color and habitat and food for wildlife. Other maple species that I predict to do really well in climate change, though, are our Florida maple or southern sugar maple. Again, this is one that is newer to the market. I don't think it's one that as many nurseries carry as some of these other species, but it's one I would encourage people to look into more. We know it's heat tolerant. It's tolerant of soggy soils. Same with the chalk bark maple, similar amount of, of flood and drought tolerance. Uh, I know that these do tend to prefer a little more shade, though, than maybe some of these heat tolerant red maple cultivars can prefer. Um, again, it's hard to say because I have more experience with these two species in the wild than I, I've seen on the streets particularly, but it's one I hope we can look into in the future because they do seem to tolerate heat and compaction really well. Red sky maple, someone dropped in chat, could be another cultivar to look into. Someone say in October and some of the other um, northern varieties are, are currently like suffering climate change. I could see that. Paper bark maple, that's an interesting one. Definitely tolerant of the heat. I've seen it do pretty well in the urban environment, paper from built to last. Yeah, paperwork maple's great. Again, it's been in the landscape for a while, so probably proven to be non-invasive. Just definitely an expensive tree to find and not really one that I think provides that sort of broad canopy and wildlife variety. Trident maple's great. That would be an example of one of those just bomb-proof kind of non-native trees. 
that really will tolerate a lot of environments where native can. I didn't include it here. I have seen it get invasive on two or three occasions, like spread and take over the forest floor. So it's one to be on the lookout, but also I, I have recommended it on planting plants before and it can be really great. Let me see if there's anything else people have dropped here. River birch, very few of the ones I planted of these I've seen die. Again, they are those adaptations that make them adaptable to the floodplain, seem to make them really well adapted to the urban area and that heat and compaction, tolerates full sun, tolerates arch soil, tolerates drought pretty well too, I've noticed. Really the only downside is it drops a lot of mess, but is there really such thing as a non-messy tree, despite what a lot of people <laughs> ask that they ask that we plant. But again, this is one we see the range goes really down into South Georgia too. And those are the ones that I'm really looking for to plant for the future up here in North Georgia are those South Georgia trees. Yeah, someone mentioned trident and paper bark under those power lines. They can't really tolerate that, that shearing really well compared to other maple species. Would not recommend putting a, a red maple somewhere where it might be utility pruned. Yellow wood. So this one's interesting. It's not one I hear a lot of people recommending for the changing climate, but I've seen it planted and thrive in some really tough conditions of full sun and radiative heat and compact soil. It's one I've seen more planted up north. So I'm curious if y'all have any experience with this, um, but it's one I might suggest, honestly, because like I said, I've just seen it really do well in my anecdotal experience in full sun and compact soil. I know it does tend to like a little more alkaline soil than we tend to get here. And maybe that's one of the reasons we don't see it um, as often. I know it does really well as a street tree in, in Northern cities, um, but I've also seen it do pretty well around the Atlanta area, despite all the pressures on it. So that's one I might encourage, especially because it does have all these great aesthetic benefits to it too. It seems to have a really strong form with minimal. Another one I might suggest looking into a bit more, but please all have experience contrary to this. Let me know. Okay, we're getting a lot of praise for the yellow wood here. Beautiful specimens, quite a bit of loss, I think, due to heat. Hmm. I'm curious, Tim, what sort of signs did you see in that dying? Did you see crown scorch or things like that? Or was it more of a general stress and pest issue? Canker? Okay, interesting. Yeah, it likes a little bit more shade than maybe some of the other species. Sweet Bay Magnolia, this is one I've, I've been recommending a lot, especially when clients want like a, a nice flowering tree and one that's nice and pretty. Fills in the, that mid to understory really well. Again, the theme you'll notice here too is those swamp conditions making it better for that urban environment in terms of being able to tolerate that flood drought cycle and that radiative heat. Someone mentioned the Keltec is a good evergreen cultivar of this. I appreciate y'all with the cultivar knowledge because that's one where I don't have as much knowledge. I tend to just go with what the nursery website says because there's just so many options out there sometimes. But yeah, a really bomb-proof tree, tolerates compaction super well. I have seen it die from radiative heat before, but those were in really extreme conditions on like post-construction sites where it was very hard to get in there to maintain them. But it has those great fragrant showy flowers too, good for wildlife. One I highly encourage and recommend a lot, especially in sunny areas. If you have a shadier area and folks want heat adapted flowering understory tree, Silver Bell is one I found that often does really well, but it really does need that shade and more drainage. Whereas these magnolias really, yeah, the Southern magnolias too are all also definitely a climate adapted tree. Any cultivar of those, your teddy bear, little gem. The saucer magnolias too, they definitely tolerate the heat. I've definitely noticed a lot more fungus on them and powdery mildew in the last few years, I suspect from increased humidity. Um, American hornbeam, a great, really tough mid story. Another example of one that can like really just tolerate a lot of uh, conditions that other trees won't. And I've seen tolerate pruning jobs that a lot of other trees won't. Um, again, has that range down in the South Georgia, so we're preparing for that future. Uh, prefers a little bit of partial shade if you can find it. I have also seen them do okay in full sun before, but can really tolerate that flood drought cycle in those compacted soils. Can tolerate some limited power line pruning and can really tolerate limited soil volume I've seen before. So really just a, a tough native tree that will fit in a lot of sites where other trees can't. If I know a tree is going in a site where I don't necessarily trust people to do maintenance on it, uh, like they said they would, this is one I often recommend. Service berry, someone mentioned this earlier, seems to just be really doing great in our changing climate. Mostly, we'll talk about this big issue in a sec, but it fills in that understory really well with showy flowers and pretty fall color and delicious berries that uh, will attract birds and wildlife. 
uh, can really tolerate that full sun. Um, in the wild, you mostly see it growing in at least partial shade to often full shade, uh, but it seems to tolerate the sun and radiate the heat really well. I've seen it do great as a street tree before if you're willing to tolerate the mess. It does, again, prefer that drain soil, but can tolerate some degree of compaction. Oh, yeah, someone mentioned some forms of the hornbeam here. Collinaire and clarinet, clarinet, C-L-A-R-Y-N-E-T. Um, again, appreciate y'all dropping these cultivar our names here. But yeah, service varies great, can fit into those small spaces, provides a lot of aesthetic value to the landscape. One issue that I've noticed that I expect to increase in the near future is that cedar apple rust that we see on the fruits. Again, not a mortality issue for the tree typically, but I think as we get more humid summers, we'll probably see more and more of that happening. Uh, I've just noticed that really taking off on those, especially humid months we've had in the summer before, uh, it can really get out of hand. Deer will decimate it in non-urban locations. They sure will. Wildlife love it of all kinds. So besides that increasing fungus rust, though, this is a really great tree, bomb-proof. I've seen it thrive in construction sites before. Um, hollies. We have a lot of really great heat-adapted native hollies here in Georgia. I guess the Yapon holly is great for that understory to even grow into a shrub, though you certainly can prune it in a tree form. It's one of those that is just truly bomb-proof from those swamp adaptations it has. Seen it do great in parking lot with radiative heat. Tolerates drought and flood really well. Again, those South Georgia swamp benefits really come into play. Same with the Savannah holly or the Dahoon holly if you're going for something a little larger. Savannah holly definitely tolerates that compaction a little less good than the, the Yapon does or the Dahoon does. But again, pretty, pretty bomb-proof species overall. Just slightly different shade or compaction requirements with these but I, and slightly different sizes with these. But again, all very tough trees that you can use versatility. So there are a lot I didn't mention here. Again, I didn't really get into non-natives today just for the sake of time. But please, if there are more, drop them in the chat. Let's talk. I'm curious to hear what y'all experiences here are. Again, you get 10 arborists, you get 12 opinions, and I'm curious to see what y'all think here. So some that are not doing so well in the urban area. Oh yeah, deciduous hollies as well. We got a lot of those too. We could do a whole, whole PowerPoint on those. So here are ones that are not doing great. Flowering dogwood, we've all seen this. The crown scorch, the anthracnose, just increased stress and pest pressure. Uh, again, that range is migrating northward. I might still recommend this being planted in shady sites with well-drained soil in North Georgia, but really just not in anything urban or really anything in Piedmont and below at this point. At that point, you should probably look for that kusa, that non-native dogwood. Yeah, they are just not doing too hot. American Beach is another one I anticipate to not do too well. It might continue to really thrive in forest settings, but definitely not one I'd super recommend for the urban area and changing climate. We're seeing increased beech leaf disease in the state too. And again, it's just not tolerant of that intense solar radiation. That thin bark is not really protected from that sun scale. Red buds too. I'm sure we've all seen the dead buds driving down the roads. Uh, again, I would still recommend this for shady sites. I think this is one that is more urban intolerant necessarily than climate change intolerant, because I think it can stand some heat, but it really likes drainage and it really likes shade. So again, if we're factoring that urbanization factor too, just not one I recommend a whole lot, especially in harsh environments with compact soil and lots of heat, but still great for more naturalized areas, I think, especially the forest pansy cultivar, it's a little more heat tolerant. Yeah, a lot of growers have stopped producing dogwoods. We had a really bad um, fungal outbreak in our, our state nursery here last year. So we've stopped growing those two at the state, at our level, at the seedling level. So yeah, I think the word has really gotten out. Dogwoods are just, just not a hot tree anymore for Georgia. It's sad, they're beautiful, they're great. But hopefully we can still plant them in, in shady and cool areas. So here are some trees that were I predict and that we're starting to see this northern rain shift happen. So again, to the left is a model of how that urban or how that rain shift works over time. Southern white oak, again, this is one we'll still probably have all throughout Georgia for the next two to 500 years, but we'll probably just start to see that rain shift northward and it become a more North Georgia species in the next hundred plus years. Um, we do need to be on the lookout for pests with this guy. Oak wilt, is, uh, oak wilt is spreading throughout the country and we predict to see more of that in Georgia in the near future. Same with some of our red oak species, the ones you find more in North Georgia, North Georgia, like your northern reds, black oaks, scarlet oak, chestnut oaks. Again, probably still viable in more shady and well-drained areas in the long run, but we'll probably just see that northern range shift over time. 
Generally speaking, those Appalachian and North Georgia species are the ones that are going to be less viable in the changing climate. The ones that need that shade and that drainage, and they're just not adapted to heat and compaction. Uh, things like, obviously, the hemlock, we've already seen massive loss of that. White pine, too, is probably going to move northward. And this is going to create a lot of ecological impacts, unfortunately, because a lot of these are keystone species of our ecosystem. But unfortunately, it just does not make sense from a, a maintenance and cost perspective, I think, to really plant these in those these species in specific, in those really hot, sunny areas that we know are going to experience a lot of those urbanization pressures. Things like the white oak and some of these red oak species, I think, are still more than fine and more forested and well-drained and shady areas. But for those urban environments, I recommend looking more to those other oak species that I presented earlier. Yeah, that's all I have as far as suggestions, too, and tree species. I appreciate y'all coming and y'all's interest today. I'd like to open it up now for any questions y'all might have or comments on trees that you've seen really well in dealing with heat and compaction and that kind of combined one-two punch of urbanization and climate change going forward. Again, I think all of us combining our experience here is going to how we're going to see those answers. So uh, I'd like to open it up if anyone has any questions. We did have a question in the Q&A on um, any thoughts about fruit and or nut trees. Mm, yeah. So... Again, the general trend is South Georgia swamp adapted trees are going to be more viable than nor more uh, montane northern Georgia adapted native species. I think things like pecan and stuff are still going to be very viable. Definitely black walnut is going to be experiencing that northern range shift. And certainly when it comes to like orchard production species like stone fruits and stuff, some of those increased pest pressures are probably going to be likely to appear in the near future. Increased humidity, leading to increased fungus and things like fire blight and powdery mildew and other things like that. I think it's fair to guess. Um, yeah, if you're looking for sort of some species suggestions, I'd recommend going on our website, gatrees.org, and under our urban forestry tab, we have our species list. And on that is at the bottom is a sort of native fruit and nut tree species that we recommend looking towards. Pawpaw is probably going to continue to do well. It's heat adapted. Pawpaw's main issue is probably going to be those urbanization pressures and those changing land uses, because it really does need some drainage. Syringia reticula. What's the common name for that? But yeah, beyond that, I can't really say. I'm not a fruit and nut tree expert. Um, um, do you have good native conifers that stay full to the ground? That was the next question. Mm. Yeah, native, not really, except for eastern red cedar. But again, that's so slow growing. Unless you're installing it as a BNB, you're probably not going to get that privacy effect you're going for, uh, which I assume is the one of the main points of planting those full coniferous ones. Um, yeah, I don't. I'd encourage people to, to drop some in the chat. Uh, as far as native ones go, uh, I'm at a loss there. So we do have a few more minutes if anybody um, wants to drop any more Q&A in the Q&A or chat in the chat box. Um, I will also, I'm, a, I'm afraid it'll get lost as people are chatting. So maybe if you have questions, put them in the Q&A, um, but I'm going to put the link for the CEU code in the chat box. So that's there now. Yeah, I feel like Papa is having a moment right now. I actually have a book on <laughs> Papa. It, it, there's a Papa festival in South Carolina this month, I think. So it it's definitely getting its its due. Someone mentioned Japanese lilac too. I'm not as familiar with that. It, it seems to be definitely hot and new on the market. I've seen it advertised in a few articles as a tree of the future for this region. I'm just always hesitant of that because we've seen that before. And then it spreads and takes over our forests. But if anyone has more experience with that species, I'd encourage you to share. Uh, somebody asked in the Q&A about the recording of this. I will post it to YouTube tomorrow and so that you can reference it. And I'll send out a link to everyone who registered for the webinar. So in case you missed a portion of it, you can go back and, and watch it again. Um, I will I'm going to keep posting the CEU link so that it, it'll be the link. So it says forms.monday.com. That's the CEU link. Awesome. I'll go ahead and drop my email in the chat here too. If anyone has any questions or uh, if GFC can be of service to your municipality or public organization, please don't hesitate to reach out. Always happy to talk trees. 
thank you so much, Jesse, for having me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Dave. This is a great presentation. I really appreciate you you helping us out here and, and answering questions and sharing your knowledge with us. It's, it's awesome to have knowledgeable people in our inner circle. So I really appreciate it. Again, if you are interested in the CEU, make sure you fill out that form. If you want a live recording, it'll be posted likely tomorrow to YouTube. Yeah, if there's no other questions... I hope you all have an excellent evening and I hope to see many of your faces in person in the upcoming weeks and at our upcoming programs. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, y'all.